Hello everyone. Welcome to the Equip for Ministry process and the Youth Ministry Focus. This is the unit that will be focusing on adolescent catechesis. My name is Craig Gould and outside of my role as teacher for this unit, I am the director of the Archdiocesan Office for Youth and Young Adult Ministry. We're going to begin our time together in prayer this morning using the scriptural account of the road to Emmaus. I invite you now to pray with me as I read the prayer on the screen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, be with us as we journey through our days. Be with us in our times of joy. Be with us when we are lost and confused. Be with us when we are comfortable. Be with us when we find ourselves hurting. Lord, be with us as we journey through our days. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now, we now turn to our reading, which comes for us from the 24th chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up, and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now I'd like to offer a reflection from the Archbishop of New York, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, that he, as he gave a reflection on this Emmaus story. The Archbishop recount. For three weeks in July 1992, I was on pilgrimage in Israel. I had a wonderful Franciscan guide who made sure I saw all the sacred places in the Holy Land. The day before I departed, he asked, Is there anything left you want to see? Yes, I replied. I would like to walk the road to Emmaus. That we cannot do, he told me. You see, no one really knows where the village of Emmaus actually was, so there is no more road to Emmaus. Sensing my disappointment, he remarked, Maybe that's part of God's providence, but we can now make every journey we undertake, 
a walk down the road to Emmaus. My new friends of this great archdiocese, would you join your new pastor on an adventure in fidelity as we turn the Staten Island Expressway, Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, Broadway, the FDR, the Major Deegan, and the New York State Thruway into the road to Emmaus as we witness a real miracle on 34th Street and turn that into the road to Emmaus. For dare to believe that from Staten Island to Sullivan County, from the Bowery to the Bronx to Newburgh, from White Plains to Poughkeepsie, he's walking right alongside us. Let us now pray together our closing prayer. Lord, be with us as we journey in your footsteps through our days. Be with us as we walk alongside others in their times of joy. Be with us as we walk alongside others who may be lost and confused. Be with us as we walk alongside others who are comfortable. Be with us as we walk alongside others who find themselves hurting. Lord, be with us as we journey in your footsteps through our days. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I'd like you to take a moment to remember your own experience of catechesis during your adolescent years. Did it involve a classroom experience in a high school or maybe a parish CCD program? Did it come from your parents? Did it involve confirmation preparation? Was there a retreat or conference experience that you had? Take a moment and to recall these instances of your own formation. And as we have reflected on our own experience of catechesis, it does cause us to pause and ask, what is adolescent catechesis? While catechesis means many different things to many different people and has been acted in many different ways, the Catechism of the Catholic Church offers this explanation. And as I read it, I invite you to mark down any words or phrases that stand out to you. The Catechism says, quite early on, the name Catechesis was given to the totality of the Church's efforts to make disciples, to help people believe that Jesus is the Son of God, so that believing they might have life in His name, and to educate and instruct them in this life, thus building up the body of Christ. The National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministry offers this vision of adolescent catechesis. Our efforts in adolescent catechesis is an effort to provide hope to a new generation by encouraging adolescents to develop a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and the Christian community and increase their knowledge of the core content of the Catholic faith. With these definitions as a foundation, I'd like to ask you now to take a few minutes and reflect. Pause the video and take time to respond to these questions. If you could write a vision statement in no more than three sentences, what would you desire as the outcomes of adolescent catechesis? What is the vision for catechesis at your school? How does it fit with what you read in the bishop's document renewing the vision? How does this vision statement fit with the one you wrote? How does it compare with your school's vision for catechesis? Now that you've had a chance to reflect, I'd like to point out the following from the statement from Renewing the Vision. Number one, catechesis helps adolescents to develop a deeper relationship with Jesus and the Christian community. Number two, catechesis increases adolescents' knowledge of the core content of the Catholic faith. Number three, catechesis helps adolescents understand sacred scripture and church tradition. And number four, catechesis helps young people live more faithfully as disciples of Jesus Christ through a life of prayer, justice, and loving service. 
There are four basic elements of catechesis, and we're going to use four C's to describe them. These four C's are context, content, communion, and conspire. We will explore these elements by retelling the Emmaus story. Emmaus story is important regarding Christian formation because it was the first presentation of the Christian story. Our first element of catechesis is context. We will now reread verses 13 through 16 of the Emmaus story. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. The disciples were walking along the road when their unrecognizable Lord appeared to them. The first issue for the Lord is the context of their situation. The disciples must unburden themselves of their fears, concerns, anxieties, and woes. The Lord enters into their walk, their story, their lives. There is not the false presumption that the disciples would have gone seeking the risen Lord. In fact, their journey along the road seems intent upon getting away or escaping the church, the secret, hidden, surviving band of disciples. The National Directory of Catechesis reminds us that conversion begins with an openness to the initial proclamation of the gospel and a sincere desire to listen to the resonance within. The Lord does not presume this as already a given in his walk with the disciples who do not yet recognize him. Those who want to engage in helping others towards discipleship should also not presume initial openness or desire. Evangelization is found in this first movement by the Lord. It was the Lord who enters the journey of the disciples, enters the context of their lives. It is the Lord that goes to them. Faith formation is found in the Lord seeking first to understand the state of the lives of the disciple, recognizing that to teach, he must understand the needs of the learners as well as to engage them amid their own needs and terms. When we minister in the context of the lives of young disciples, we are addressing the living side of their maturing faith. Addressing the context of the lives of young disciples is appealing to the heart, to what they feel as a part of the disciple, to the affective dimension of the person. Within the context of the lives of young disciples, here are some signposts along their journey. Young disciples have positive self-images because they believe that they are God's cherished creation. They are working towards fully forming their own identity and path. Young disciples are also forming lives that are based upon values. They are developing the ability to critically consider the choices and consequences of decision made, not only by themselves, but others as well. Young disciples are growing in their understanding of intimacy within relationships. They are acquiring both experiences and skills for friendship. They are developing an appreciation and a respect for differences among their neighbors. Our young people need to know that they are valued. They should be recognized in their community as well as their church as members of the faith community. We need to find ways to communicate with them utilizing their own preferred technologies from greeting them on the street to posting on their Facebook pages. And finally, they should be able to recognize that those connected with the church are interested enough to listen to their own concerns as they attempt to form values and relationships. Our second C is content. We will now read verses 16 through 27 of the Emmaus story. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? 
He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him, who he had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. After listening, when the right to be heard has been earned and achieved, the stranger responds by unpacking the scriptures likely heard many times previously. Now hearing it in the light of their experience, it takes on new meaning. This content is neither watered down or delivered even softly or gently, but the content is clearly delivered in response to the experiences, needs, and openness of the recipient. Content assists the young disciple in making connections between life and faith. Regarding the process of conversion, the natural, National Directory of Catechesis anticipates that an openness and desire leads a person to know Christ more personally and to know more about him. The content of the person, message, and mission of Christ enable to aspiring disciples to make decisions regarding their life and faith. Ongoing evangelization occurs here in the Lord's expression that there is more depth to the disciples' faith tradition and the suggestion that they just might be missing it. Catechesis occurs with, quote-unquote, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets. This is a specific and intentional response to the disciples. It is piecing together all the clues of their life and assisting them in solving their own confused mysteries regarding the faith. If we were only to address the context of young people's lives, we could easily be accused of emotional manipulation. There is something more to faith, and that is found within speaking towards the content of the lives of young disciples, which also cannot be the sole dimension necessary for discipleship. We are addressing the explicit side of their maturing faith. Addressing the content of the lives of young disciples is appealing to the head of the disciple about what to know, to the cognitive dimension of the person. As young disciples begin to consider the content of their faith, they are completing an introduction in some areas which has engaged their interest towards a lifelong formation in faith. Young disciples embark on the journey of faith formation with the following. Young disciples are developing the skills and ability to apply faith to their daily life experiences. Young disciples are developing an appreciation for the scriptures as well as an understanding of the tradition of the church. Young disciples are acquiring both experiences and skills to make moral decisions. This includes, but is not limited to, making choices related to living a chaste lifestyle. Our young people need to know what it is that we value. The church has a message of love and truth available for young people. We should pre present it unabashedly. It is our intention to equip young disciples by introducing them to Jesus Christ, inviting them to experience the rich tradition of the Catholic Church, as well as skills for Christian living. Our third element of adolescent catechesis is that of communion. We will now read verses 28 to 32 of the Emmaus story. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, 
were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? The context and content of the Emmaus walk will eventually lose value and meaning if it is not offered within the experience of the Emmaus meal or communion. Communion is the ongoing commitment of an intimate relationship with both God and God's people. Our tradition or religious imagination, our sensibilities regarding sacrament, justice, and holiness are all communicated within our quote-unquote staying with one another and sharing prayer and meal together. It is when minds are enlightened and hearts are enkindled that signs begin to speak. The process of conversion leads the disciples towards the taking their own life experiences and their knowledge of the Lord and making a living, explicit, and fruitful confession of faith. It is this profession of faith that forms the foundation for the continuing journey of faith of the disciples under the care and guidance of the Holy Spirit. This conversion is nourished in the life and sacraments of the community. The invitation to remain and the acceptance to do so are also part of evangelization. In an all too brief but intense encounter, an intimate relationship in faith is being built. The catechetical teaching that began with Moses and the prophets is now brought to culmination in the remembrance of the Last Supper experience. In this action, a teaching without words but with ultimate reading, recognition has occurred. When we minister with young disciples seeking to break them into the communal nature of our faith and church, we are encouraging them, in their maturing faith, to make their lives a confession of faith. Addressing the communion aspect of the lives of young disciples is helping them to determine where their feet will be and who they are and where they will go. It addresses the spiritual dimension of the person. As young disciples enter into full communion with God in their community, they are developing habits which will sustain their faith throughout their lives. Their spiritual training could include a commitment to grow in maturity in their personal faith. This includes a conscious choice to deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ through prayer, study, and reflection an active participation in the sacramental life of the church, a desire to actively participate in the life and ministries of the church. This, of course, is first formed by their own understanding of this life and ministry as lived with their own domestic church, that of their family and parents or guardians. Young people need to be fully integrated into the life of our faith communities. They need mentoring as they express their discipleship through serving as apprentices in church ministries. Our fourth and final element is conspire. We will now read verses 33 to 35 of the Emmaus story. That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened to them on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. When Christianity first started, to gather, to pray, to be community, were all perceived as subversive countercultural acts. To be Christian made a tacit agreement to conspire with other Christians and with the Spirit in living towards the reign of God. Conspire is an interesting word to break down, con meaning with and spirit meaning to breathe. To conspire describes something so intimate as to share the same breath with another, as in a deep kiss that causes each lover to gasp together. To conspire means to share the same breath with the Creator, the one who provides the breath of life. In both those acts, such intimacy must bring about life. St. Paul describes of the Galatians the fruits of such moments as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The change in our course of life that comes with the Spirit of God in our lives must be evident. Those with a fruitful faith understand that it compels them to action. They seek to right the wrongs that are both within their personal life as well as within society around them. 
They act upon the conviction in the Lord's Prayer that God's reign should come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those with a fruitful faith also personally assume some responsibility to be engaged in the world and serve as a living witness of faith, sharing the good news in their lives by serving as a witness with their daily selves. When in the lives of young disciples we invite them into the conspiracy of our faith, we are addressing the fruitful side of their maturing faith. One of the most oft phrases found in the Bible include, Peace be with you, and be not afraid. Encouraging the conspiratorial aspects of the lives of young disciples is helping them determine how their hands of service, what they might do, might best be utilized in the Lord's name. It addressed the behavioral dimensions of their person. The intention to conspire in faith with the Lord and the church should be able to be detected by a desire to grow in personal holiness. This includes attempting to clearly discern their Christian vocation in the world. An imperative to be an agent of change for the spirit of peace and justice, as well as to be a defender of the worth and dignity of the Creator's best creation, each individual person. A compelling urgency to offer service in God's name. Our young people need to have the invitation and opportunity to engage their lives in faith. After having received much in a faith community, they need to be encouraged to give much in response. Again, each element of catechesis engages different parts of the adolescent. Context affects their heart and what to feel. Content affects their head and addresses their knowledge. Communion impacts their feet and who they want to be. And the final C, to conspire, affects the hands of adolescence. Having reviewed the four C's, it is important to now reflect on the following question. What are the challenges of addressing all four C's in the present format and vision of catechesis in your school? Please take a moment to reflect on this. Now that you've had a chance to reflect, we're ready to turn and look at the article, Forming Young Disciples, which you should have read in preparation for our time together. Some of the main questions that result from the article are, are our Catholic teens, who according to the National Study of Youth and Religion, are remarkably inact inarticulate about their faith, simply symptomat symptomatic of more profound deficiencies? Are more and better youth ministry, catechesis, and religious instruction good and helpful, yet utterly inadequate correctives? Has our default preoccupation with conventional religious education blinded us to more profound deficiencies in our ecclesial, that is, our church life, that too often render our catechetical efforts impotent? Is the faith formation system we inherited, which developed in response to a different set of cultural and societal circumstances, specifically setting poor Catholic European immigrants on a trajectory towards economic prosperity, what we need now? What were some of your initial reactions to some of the questions raised by Sean Reynolds' article? Do our schools establish young people on a trajectory towards Catholic Christian discipleship and active engagement in the Catholic Church, or not? If so, how might they do so even more effectively? If not, what indeed is their purpose, and what is their impact on our other Catholic institutions that do have discipleship as their mission? The effectiveness of our parish, school, and family efforts in adolescent faith formation can be assessed by witnessing faith communities alive with young people who demonstrate their love of God and their Catholic faith in the following ways. Young people sustain a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, supported through regular prayer, faith sharing, and scripture reading. Young people share the good news through words and actions, through Christian stewardship and working for peace, justice, and human dignity. Young people participate fully, consciously, actively, and regularly in the celebrations of the sacramental life of the Catholic Church. 
Young people are able to articulate the fundamental teachings of the Catholic faith and demonstrate a commitment to learning and growing in this faith. Young people apply Catholic ethics, virtues, principles, values, and social teaching to moral decision-making, life situations, and interactions with a larger culture. Young people discern and use their gifts to actively belong to and participate in the life and mission of the parish, school, and larger community. Young people celebrate cultural and racial and ethnic diversity as a gift from God and pursuing the development of Christian community across all of those cultural, racial, and ethnic backgrounds in their parishes, schools, and broader communities. Young people begin exploring God's call to vocation through prayer, reflection, and discernment. Thank you for taking the time to learn and reflect on the Catechesis of Adolescence. Additional information can be found in the resources listed here on this slide. As always, we welcome you to contact our office if you have any questions or if you have any interest in furthering your own development and discipleship, especially geared towards those of adolescents. May God bless you and the ministry that you have been called to.